Well, we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. I must inform the House that questions 1 and 2 have been withdrawn. I therefore call Mr Alistair Ross. Mr Ross. Number 3, please. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. We have a Corporation Tax Northern Ireland Act which enables powers to transfer from April of 2017. <coughs> However, that of course is subject to the executive demonstrating its finances remain on a sustainable footing for the long term. For my part, I want to see the devolution of these important powers, and my officials are engaging uh, with uh, their Whitehall government counterparts to ensure appropriate arrangements are in place to realise that ambition. Mr. Ross, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm going to first of all commend the Minister for her work in her current role and previous role in helping us get to the point where uh, devolution of corporation tax powers is a, is a reality. I think that the Minister will know that the expectation of the business community and the frustration that there was at the, the failure of some to implement the Stormont House Agreement that potentially jeopardised the, the possibility of getting corporation tax powers. And I agree with the Minister <coughs> that hopefully the talks process that's ongoing at the moment will help us get to the point where we can realise the potential that uh, lowering the rate of corporation tax has. Can I ask the Minister, however, given the budget statement on the 8th of July, whether the cost uh, to devolving corporation tax and lowering it down to the level that we talked about previously uh, has reduced as, a, uh, as a, a working out of that budget announcement? I thank the member for his question. and uh, He will understand, of course, that the Azores <coughs> principle uh, applies in relation to the Northern Ireland Block Grant and uh, whilst uh, the position of corporation tax was in the high 20s, um, obviously as it, uh, the main rate, as I call it, uh, in the UK uh, continues to come down, then the cost uh, to the Northern Ireland Block grant therefore also falls. And an initial uh, assessment of the impact of the budget announcement uh, back on the 8th of July uh, whereby the corporation tax rate reduction uh, comes to 19% in 2017 and 18% uh, in 2020, uh, means that the cost to us in terms of our block grant uh, will probably be on full implementation in the region of 240 uh, million in 2020-2021. That, of course, uh, presumes that we set a date uh, and a rate for corporation tax uh, in 20, in sorry, yes, 2018, um, and of course we haven't had that agreement uh, as yet, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, but we are hopeful that we are moving in the right direction. Call Mr. Alex Easton. Question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's question number four. <laughs> Uh, the Secretary of State has confirmed that funding as set out in the Stormont House Agreement will be released to enable public sector voluntary exit schemes to come into operation as planned. As a result, I have authorised allocations from the Transformation Fund to allow the first exits under the scheme to progress in accordance with the recommendations of the Public Sector Restructuring Steering Group. Executive colleagues were advised of the position on 7 September. Mr. Easton for supplementary. Um, could I thank the Minister for her answer? How many posts will uh, be lost by 2015-16 period? What are the expected uh, pay bill savings? Thank you. Well, in terms of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, uh, which is the largest of the public sector voluntary exit schemes, uh, around 867 staff will leave at the end of this month, uh, with a further 763 scheduled to leave at the end of November. In total, uh, the first two tranches of exits, which uh, I've just uh, indicated, will come up to about 1,630 individuals, uh, will deliver a pay bill saving of almost £48 million per annum. And uh, departments have indicated a requirement to exit around 2,700 full-time equivalent posts uh, this financial year, and further offers uh, will be made in due course. Ms. Rosie McCorley. Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, can, can she confirm that uh, all departments will be able to offer a first class service to all citizens in the wake of these departures? Well, of course, uh, it's very important that we continue to provide essential public services uh, in the, the way that our citizens are, are used to, and uh, therefore, a range of measures have been 
put in place, including a redeployment arrangement in some cases uh, to move staff into essential posts left vacant by staff who leave uh, via the exit scheme uh, at the end of the month and indeed in November. So absolutely, each department is uh, undertaking an assessment in relation to business continuity uh, and they are prioritising their work uh, accordingly. So I can confirm that that is the case. I'll call Mr. Jerry Kelly. Uh, Carl, I have a uh, question for. Sorry, question five. I do think. Everybody's confused today. Um, there are many factors that impact on the business environment and, crucially, business confidence. Some of the most important include the quality and stability of our political institutions, a supportive business infrastructure, and a high-quality education system. These are areas that the executive has focused on, not least in delivering its economic strategy, for example. It is right that any allegations in relation to the sale of NAMA assets are investigated thoroughly by the appropriate authorities. However, I am not aware of any evidence which suggests that they are having a negative impact on international business confidence. Mr. Kelly, for a supplementary. <laughs> And Frederick G. Shaw, I thank the Minister for answering up tonight. Would she uh, agree, just on the basis of what you were saying, there, uh, with trans, uh, sorry, Transparency International, which compiles an annual list of corruption uh, uh, with governments uh, throughout the world uh, to root out, which argues to root out robustly uh, embezzlement, fraud, etc., uh, so that we do not have um, our international uh, investment? Uh, um, attacked in the way it has been, in the way I believe it has been at the moment. Well, I absolutely agree that we have to have an open and transparent system of government, and indeed the index uh, that we use in this respect is the Global Competitive Index, and uh, that looks at a number of key factors and has a particular focus on the importance of the macro uh, economic environment. And in that respect, of course, I'm sure everyone will agree with me uh, in this House that the absence of paramilitary activity is a key element uh, of that macro economic uh, environment. And therefore, we have to deal uh, with paramilitary activity if, if it is proven to be present. And that is a key element for the Stormont House talks, as, the, as you are aware, Principal Deputy Speaker. Call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that the Finance Committee is currently carrying out an inquiry into the um, claims around NAMA. Has the Minister any concerns that the inquiry that is taking place, that um, if it gets too close to the wire and certain, certain in, inquiries or, in, or um, information it receives, that there may be the potential to um, you know, cause any difficulties for the NCA's um, investigations? Well, as I said in my uh, original answer, it is important that there is a, a thorough investigation uh, by the appropriate authorities, and uh, I understand that the uh, committee uh, members are to meet with representatives from the National Crime Agency uh, in, uh, I think, in the coming week. I, I think it would be important uh, to listen to the advice that they give them in relation to their inquiry uh, to make sure that uh, there are no issues that prevent the NCA completing their inquiry uh, in the most uh, robust way possible. Call Ms. Megan Farrell. Question, question six. Uh, my department routinely engaged with NAMA to discuss a range of issues prior to the sale of the Project Eagle portfolio. The purpose of these discussions was to make representations about any known NAMA actions or plans which might have been detrimental or indeed damaging to the recovery of the Northern Ireland economy, including the local property market at that time. Ms Fagan for a supplementary. Concord. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, can I ask the Minister why her Permanent Secretary and her department continue to hide from the Finance Committee inquiry um, around the NAMA issue? I would ask if it is for party political reasons, because I don't know if anyone really believes the NCA excuse that the DUP are hiding behind. Sorry, I didn't catch the last bit of the question, but as regards uh, Mr Sterling, uh, my permanent secretary, hiding from the committee, as I have understood it, he has been uh, to the committee on two occasions now and has been very helpful to the committee, as I understand it. So I'm not quite sure uh, where the member is coming from in relation to your question. Call Mr Jim Allister. So on what basis did the Finance Minister, back in January 2014, advise NAMA that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister were both fully engaged with the PIMCO bid 
What did that mean? And given the role of her department in the appointment of Frank Krishnan to the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee of NAMA, is part of her, her anxiety to stay in office and act as a self-professed gatekeeper so that she can protect the chronicles of NAMA from vigorous scrutiny? Well, I know that Jim is fond of fiction, and I'm sure he enjoys the chronicles of Narnia on, uh, on an ongoing basis. But of course, yes, well, uh, I think it would do him good to read the chronicles of Narnia as well, uh, and its Christian basis. But in any event, um, Minister Wilson, uh, when he... Um, I'm waiting for the member to finish. Uh, Minister Wilson simply responded uh, to a request from the Irish Government to put forward nominations uh, for NAMA, Northern Ireland Advisory Committee, uh, of which uh, Mr Cushnahan was one uh, of those nominees. Uh, and so there's no mystery uh, surrounding that issue. Um, in relation to the issue uh, around uh, the, uh, the, my, my colleague, I think he's referring to my colleague, uh, Minister Hamilton, uh, in relation to what he had to say. Obviously, that's an issue that he will have to take up with Minister Hamilton. I can't say what was in Minister Hamilton's mind at that particular point in time, uh, because I'm not Minister Hamilton. Call Mr. Adrian Cochrane Watson. Mr. Deputy President. Speaker, uh, could I ask the minister, minister, could she assure the House that all transactions and discussions between the Department with regards to NAMA and um, the subsequent sale have been shared with this House or will be shared with this House and the relevant committee? Well, I understand that the documents that the committee have uh, asked for are currently being gone through, and indeed uh, we are in discussion uh, with the National Crime Agency to make sure that we do not hinder any investigation that they are involved in, and uh, that is where we are at present. Mr. Colin Eastwood is not in his place. I call Mr. Ross. Question, yet, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I will answer questions 8, <coughs> 10, and 13 together. Failure to implement welfare reform has put at risk the budget flexibilities negotiated in the Stormont House Agreement, which included flexibilities to repay both the 100 million reserve claim in 2014 15 and the 114 million reduction to our budget for non implementation of welfare reform from capital budgets. In addition to these central pressures, departments have registered resource Dell pressures in the June monitoring round of £234.6 uh, million, with only £10,000 of resource Dell reduced requirements declared by departments. Call Mr. Hussey for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister detail her, her best assessment of by how much Northern Ireland is likely to exceed this year's resource allocations if it remains in the current tra trajectory? Well, I'm hoping that we don't uh, remain in the current trajectory and that we are able to deal with some of the financial issues uh, uh, during the Stormont House Agreement because we really need to have those flexibilities that were agreed in the initial Stormont House uh, Agreement to allow us to proceed in terms of our budget. Uh, certainly, what we don't want to see happening uh, is that we breach our control totals at the end of the year because, of course, that would be looked upon uh, in a very bad light uh, by Treasury and may have impacts for us in following years. So we're working very hard to deal with those issues, but as you can see from uh, my substantive answer, there's quite uh, a challenge ahead of us in relation to dealing with our resource deal. Call Mr. Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Obviously, the finances minister would be in a much better position had those parties that reneged on the Stormont House Agreement uh, implemented that agreement, uh, which they signed up to last year. Uh, how much funding would be lost to Northern Ireland if the Stormont House Agreement is not now implemented? In addition to the flexibilities which I have already uh, made reference to, we will also lose £150 million of funding over five years. Uh, to pay for institutions to help us to deal uh, with the past, which of course is a very significant issue that does need to be dealt with and dealt with quickly. 
and £500 million over 10 years for capital projects to support shared uh, and integrated education projects uh, will also be lost. And again, uh, that was a significant amount of money over uh, 10 years, and we really could do with that in terms of some of the capital projects, some of which I'm aware of, uh, in terms of shared education, which were, indeed were very worthy. Call Mr. Samuel Gardner. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, is it possible for the executive to survive this financial year without an agreement on welfare reform? Well, certainly my view has always been that we need to agree welfare reform to allow us to move forward uh, with, a, with the budget that we agreed back at the end uh, uh, of, the, this, of the summer. And uh, as you know, that the budget was predicated on welfare reform going ahead. Uh, and therefore we need to have that agreement in place and indeed all of the other flexibilities in place so that we don't breach our control totals by the end of the year. So uh, yesterday we heard from uh, the Deputy First Minister that we should put up or shut up. So I think that applies in many other cases as well. Mr Fergal McKinney is not in his place. I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Uh, thank you very much uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Kesh Devery Hinde, question 11. As with all business matters, I would expect my officials to cooperate fully with the committee as it continues with its inquiry into the sale of NAMA assets in Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Bradley for a supplementary. Um, would the Minister agree with me that if the, the public or indeed members of this House uh, have the impression that something is being withheld by any party or any department that that creates the impression in the public mind that there's some sort of cover-up and would she agree with me that there's a necessity in these matters for total and complete transparency Yes, I, I absolutely agree that there's a need for transparency. There's also a need uh, to respect uh, the investigations that are going on by the National Crime Agency, and I would imagine that, the, uh, that Mr. Bradley, being the vice chairman of the committee, would appreciate that that is important, that that proceeds in the proper way uh, as well. Uh, and therefore, there is a need to make sure that we do not uh, either uh, directly or indirectly or inadvertently uh, do something uh, that will cause difficulties for that investigation and that is my sole concern uh, in terms of DFP. Call Mr Roy Beggs. I too believe that it's important that there is total transparency on, on this issue and so will the Minister assure this House that she will put into the public domain uh, any involvement her department has had with NAMA and in particular on the question of fees uh, as part of the sale to C Cerberus um, Pimco, will she put all that into the public domain, which does not prejudice anybody, but simply provides transparency to the public? Well, uh, I'm not sure of the expertise of the member asking that question in relation to the NCA uh, inquiry. I hope he's not suggesting that he has some expertise uh, that the NCA uh, haven't got. Um, but certainly, uh, we have been engaging with uh, the National Crime Agency. We are sharing the information, all of the information which the department uh, have. And I'm not sure what he's talking about in relation to fees, because um, there's nothing I have seen that talks about fees in any one way. Uh, but we have shared all of the information uh, that we have held uh, in order to seek confirmation that its release will not, um, uh, in the NCA's determination, be prejudicial. And I think that everybody in this House should be concerned that that's the case. They want to ensure that the NCA are able to do their job in the most efficient and effective way possible. Call Mr Chris Little. Question number 12. I have commissioned the Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre to carry out an independent audit into the cost of division, and I anticipate that a draft report will be available uh, later this calendar year. On Mr. Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her update. It's encouraging to hear of progress in relation to that Stormont House Agreement commitment uh, to audit the cost of Division II departments. And can I ask the, the Minister, given the significant pressure uh, on our public finances that is faced by the Executive, uh, how urgent a priority does she consider 
uh, this study in order to uh, feed into reconfiguration of our public service delivery on a shared rather than separate basis. Well, I thank the member for his supplementary question. And actually, uh, this is an issue. I don't think I'm breaching any confidences when I, when I say that. That was raised um, in the process today at Stormont House talks. Um, and I do hope that we may be able to. If the report isn't due to be with us uh, until November, but I'm going to try uh, and have that report with me uh, by October, if possible, so that we can figure it into uh, what we're trying to do around our budgetary processes uh, at the moment. Uh, the House is probably aware, and members are probably aware, uh, that the uh, comprehensive spending review um, isn't supposed to kick off until I think it's the 25th of November. That causes us some difficulties in relation to our draft budget process, uh, and therefore we're trying to get a clearer picture uh, of uh, how we move forward. We're going to take. We have, of course, outlined forecasts and what have you in relation to our budgetary process. Uh, but it is difficult to be definitive until, because we don't get the actual figures until uh, the end of November, and that causes us some difficulty. So I'm trying to have all of the other uh, pieces in place uh, before then. Mr. Pat Ramsey is not in his place. Mr. Gordon Dunn is not in his place. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. The members listed for topical questions 4, 6 and 7 have withdrawn their names. I therefore call Mr Jerry Kelly. The Minister will be aware that there is a growing scandal around the Volkswagen manufacturer around the emissions of diesel engines and the effect of course it will have on customers not only in America of course but here also and indeed maybe wider on the population. Does the Minister have any intention or has she raised the issue with uh, Volkswagen uh, um, air locally or uh, in Britain? No, I haven't uh, raised that issue and I suppose in and around the emissions um, th there are stricter uh, criteria in uh, the USA than here uh, in Europe uh, and that uh, is what has caused the difficulty uh, in America and that, that has been uh, what seems to be Volkswagen have taken this innovative approach to try and, and disguise the fact of emissions of their cars. Um, and it, it will cost uh, the company severe embarrassment, and it looks as if billions of pounds have been wiped off uh, their share price uh, overnight, uh, literally in relation to this matter. So it's a very serious issue, uh, one probably more uh, for the Environment Minister in terms uh, of emissions, um, but in terms of production uh, of Volkswagen, it will cause them great difficulties. Mr Kelly for a supplementary. Uh, going by useless, and I, I thank the Minister uh, for her answer. And, and I agree with her, it is uh, very serious. And while there may be a difference in terms of the emissions, I understand that there is uh, already questions about it being raised in Europe. Uh, I'm simply, I suppose, asking the Minister if uh, on behalf of the Assembly it could be raised in terms of the North and the people uh, who are indeed affected by it. And there is also, because of that, and because of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, smart chips that they're using that they could easily be used in other uh, vehicles uh, and manufacturers as well. So this, this uh, scandal could be much bigger than it, it, it already is. So I'm wondering if we can make some sort of effort of, uh, of making an intervention here to see what the, uh, what the story is. I certainly can pass uh, on his concerns uh, in terms of the emissions problem to the Minister of the Environment uh, and to the Executive more widely through correspondence. Um, I do think that in America they are taking uh, steps to uh, check other vehicles to see if there have been uh, other vehicles involved in, in what will be known as the Volkswagen scandal. So it will cause great difficulties for them. There's no doubt about that. Call Mr. Sean Lynch. Can the minister give a progress report on opening up a stormwood grounds to the public for leisure and recreation? Well. <laughs> I really do agree with the previous speaker. The previous speaker, as you know, took a, a very progressive uh, point of view in relation to opening up um, Parliament buildings to the public, and that has continued under the uh, current incumbent. I really welcome that uh, because a lot of people 
had not visited uh, Parliament buildings before then, and it's great to see the number of young people who now engage in visits to Parliament buildings. And we're looking uh, at the grounds in terms of what we can do, uh, and indeed there are uh, a number of events, as the member will be aware, which have taken place on the grounds of uh, Stormont, and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to come forward with proposals and share those with the committee as well. Mr Lynch for supplementary. Yeah, and I want to thank the Minister for her answer, and she did uh, intimate that there were other events, and she'd be aware that there is a, a run each Sunday morning. Each Sunday morning there's a run to the grounds, and will she make the uh, Parliament buildings, the facilities, car parking facilities available for those participants? I, I will have to check in relation to whether that, uh, those car parks are under my control or whether they're under the control of uh, Parliament buildings and the Commission, um, but certainly it's something I can come back to the member about. Call Mr Stewart Dixon. Okay, um, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, going back to the question that my, my colleague Chris Little raised with you, can I further uh, extend the question by asking you, do you believe that it's tenable that spending of hundreds of millions of pounds uh, uh, sustaining our segregated education system is a sensible uh, cost, uh, use of funds uh, given the cutting of university places? Well, I was going to say... Uh uh, Mr Dixon, that's uh, above my pay grade uh, in terms of the uh, different sectors uh, in education. Of course, if we had a clean uh, slate, we wouldn't start from here. That much is very clear. Uh, but we do have a, a large number, in my opinion, of different sectors, and we have to try and deal with what we have. But certainly, uh, and I know this is something you may not agree with me on, uh, I uh, engage uh, on... Um, quite uh, numerous occasions with the shared education sector and I see the work that has been going on with the control sector and the maintained sector, in Fermanagh in particular, and how that is bringing young people together. And it really is very um, impactive for those communities because it's not only bringing the young people together, it's also actually bringing the parents together in a way that they hadn't been brought together before. Mr. Dixon, for supplementary. Um, uh, I thank the minister for, for, for her answer so far. Minister, can I also ask you that the use of uh, public funds um, to continue segregation, whether it's in education or indeed in other services, distorts our public service um, obligations here in Northern Ireland and distorts how we spend our money. And that in order for us to be the first class region that we all aspire to be, that we need to remove those distortions from our budgeting. Well, I do say to the member again that uh, we wouldn't start from here in a wide range of, of issues, but we have to deal with where we are, and therefore we have to have transitional arrangements to deal with where we are. And I do look forward uh, to the report from um, the University of Ulster, or Ulster University, to give it its proper title now, uh, which I hope we can have uh, sooner rather than later so that we can discuss what they have found to be the case. Call Mr. Patsy McLaughlin. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five. Could I ask the Minister, in regard to the Desert Crate project at outside Cookstown, uh, previously some uh, estimated five, £53 million had been lost because the project had not been initiated. And on those occasions, when we had the Minister for Justice and his official before the Justice Committee, they apportioned responsibility to the Department of Finance to seek that. Could I ask if the Minister has renewed or resumed uh, negotiations with the Treasury in relation to reinstatement of, that money, of those monies for the project? Well, certainly uh, I did receive some correspondence from the Minister of Justice recently in relation to the ongoing work that is taking place. And, uh, uh, glad to see that that work does progress. Um, uh, certainly, when we do have a definitive figure in relation to the site, uh, we will work with colleagues to make sure that we make as many representations to the Treasury as we can. Uh, that money was ring fenced at the time, as he knows, um, and then it just went back into uh, Treasury again. It was never actually ours, it was ring fenced in Treasury. So, we need to uh, make the case again for uh, Desert Crete, and I'm happy to do so along with colleagues. Mr. McLean, for a supplement. Okay, uh, I, I appreciate and thank the Minister for her response. Uh, could the Minister give some indication, it, it can do later on by writing if she hasn't immediately got, of the level of financial commitment 
presently by the executive to that project? In front of me, so I'm happy to write to the member after today and give him those figures. I'll call Mr. Stephen Ignew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Members will be aware that the focus in today's uh, storm and house talks were to be on welfare reform and financial issues. And could I ask the Minister, one possible outcome that's been mooted is that the uh, UK government could take back power for welfare reform and, and legislate uh, to some extent over our heads. If that were to happen, are there any legislative barriers from Northern Ireland still uh, agreeing its own top-up fund? It largely, actually, and, uh, and let's be clear, we hope that that doesn't happen and we hope that the parties can uh, finally, finally come to a decision in relation uh, to the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement and welfare reform. Um, but of course it largely depends, if that isn't uh, to be the case, uh, the Secretary of State has indicated that she will uh, legislate at welfare uh, or at Westminster and then it will depend what power she takes to do that and what that looks like. Um, there are a number of uh, options open to her and we will have to wait and see. But as I say, I hope that we can come to an agreement in Stormont House and that won't happen. Mr Agnew for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answer. And obviously, it is preferable that we, we legislate and indeed use the powers that we have available in Northern Ireland. But I, I would point to Scotland, where uh, welfare wasn't devolved, yet they still implemented a, a fund to negate the impacts of the, the bedroom tax. Um, so, barring failure to find political agreement around that, um, is, is there any major difference between Westminster legislating and us putting forward the legislative difference? We can still introduce our own top-up fund to mitigate against the impacts. Uh, well, I, I hear what the member is saying, but I suppose we would be concerned that there may be a gap uh, between the primary legislation and the secondary legislation. And during that gap, what happens to welfare recipients? Uh, are they having to deal with uh, GB um, uh, instead of having the mitigations that we agreed at the Stormont House Agreement. So that is a matter of concern, I have to say, and I, I know what the member says about the Scottish system, but you have to remember uh, that they were in the GB system for quite a while before they had the mitigation put in place. Um, the mitigations, as I understand it, were only agreed a couple of months ago, uh, I think of, a, of the order of 100 million. Um, so they have put that into place, but certainly I'm sure the whole house would agree with me it would not be a good situation to be in if we had the GB model in place uh, for I don't know how long uh, which uh, without the mitigation measures and that that would be a problem. Mr Colum Eastwood is not in his place I call Ms Megan Fairley. And um, can I ask if the Minister will bring forward proposals for the North to have its own social value legislation so that public competition is far, fairer and goes further to support social enterprises and SMEs? Well, as the Member is probably aware, the Central Procurement Directorate uh, have engaged on this issue quite extensively. Uh, if the Member has a particular uh, suggestion in relation to how we should take that forward, I'd be happy to meet with her and discuss those issues. Uh, but there have been social clauses included in many of the uh, public sector procurement that, have ha that has happened. Uh, and just from my own experience in Dete, uh, when we uh, were involved in the uh, building of the Titanic Centre, we did have a number of social clauses in there, and they worked to great effect, um, I have to say. But if the member has other suggestions, we're quite happy to look at them. Ms. Fair and first supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for answers, and uh, thanks for the offer. I'm sure me and my party colleagues will be more than happy to take um, that offer up. And I'm sure the Minister will agree that our focus should be on further in our programme for government commitment um, to social values. Yeah, it's important to uh, look at all of our programme for government uh, targets and to make sure that we deliver on those, and uh, I'm sure that's something that everybody in the House would agree with. Time is now up, but before we move on, uh, during the questions to the Environment Minister, the Environment Minister made it known that he was aware that Mr Oliver McMullen had withdrawn his question. I indicated to the Minister that Mr McMullen should follow the correct procedure. We now understand that Mr McMullen did follow the correct procedure, but the top table were not aware of the, him having done so. We apologise to him. We change the top table.